The second book of the Transcendental Dialectic has three chapters. One on the paralogisms, one on the antinomy, and one on the ideal of pure reason. So we now come to the antinomy, which is, by the way, very, very long. In some ways, the antinomy is much like the paralogisms. Right? In the paralogisms, Kant taught us that reason is subject to a sort of inherent illusion that almost forces us into these mistakes in our metaphysical reasoning, whereby we believe we can come to know things like the simplicity of the soul or the immortality of the soul, all those kinds of things. In the antinomy too, we are going to find that there is a certain illusion inherent in reason. And yet what Kant does, like the very structure of the antinomy, is very different from the paralogisms. Um, it is, I would say, more interesting than that of the paralogisms. And it is, I mean, if you had to choose between reading one of these two parts of the book, I would definitely choose the antinomy, which is a lot of fun and uh, has a lot of very interesting content. So what is strange about the antinomy, which we will uh, find very soon when we get to uh, the second section, is that in the antinomy, reason isn't so much led to a particular wrong conclusion, like the simplicity of the soul, but rather reason is led to two conclusions, both of which seem to have like perfectly good arguments in their, in their favor. So in the paralogisms, the arguments were fallacious. In these arguments, you know, they, they seem to be sort of perfectly good. Um, but unfortunately, the claims that these arguments lead us to are immediate contradictions of each other. So Kant, for instance, is going to tell us that there is a perfectly good argument that shows that the world must have a beginning in time and a perfectly good argument that shows that the world cannot have a beginning in time. And of course, this is a somewhat problematic combination. And we will find that the same is true, for instance, about the divisibility of matter, uh, as well as the existence of freedom. So that is something that Kant is going to spend some time showing to us. Right? The long second section of this uh, antinomy consists of Kant going through all these arguments and showing that, you know, there are pretty good reasons to hold on to these opposed points of view, to these opposed claims. But of course, they can't both be true, right? It can't be true that the world must have a beginning in time and that the world cannot have a beginning in time. And so after section two, Kant is slowly going to unravel the problem for us. And of course, this has a lot to do with his transcendental idealism and the fact that there's, that, that there's something wrong in our use of reason when we accept these arguments. But we will get there when we get there. So at the beginning of the second chapter, in sort of this first little introductory uh, paragraph, Kant says that uh, a new phenomenon of human reason shows itself. This is at A407. A new phenomenon of human reason shows itself, namely a wholly natural antithetic. And with antithetic, Kant means this phenomenon that there's the thesis and there's a sort of antithesis that, that is opposed to it. And both of them seem equally good, right? Both of them seem to be equally based in reason. And so reason is sort of in conflict with itself, right? And that is very different from the paralogisms where reason went wrong, but it wasn't in conflict with itself. Here, reason is in conflict with itself. And that, of course, means there is a sociological element or a historical element to the story as well. That, of course, means that the philosophers have always been quarreling about this. Right? Because, as Kant tells us, um, you could always win in any of these quarrels because there was a good argument for your position as long as you made sure that you gave the last argument. Um, and then, of course, a philosopher on the other side would pop up and say, no, no, I have an even better argument. And it could continue discussing and 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 discussing forever until Kant came along. Or at least that is Kant's ambition. Right, to put a stop to this. So, the first section, the system of cosmological ideas, we know that Kant wouldn't be Kant if he didn't have some nice table of all the ways in which things could go wrong, which is built uh, on the table of the categories 
And this is precisely what happens finally on A415, um, where Kant gives us this nice little table that will structure the second section. Um, by the way, from the antinomy onwards, the A and the B version of the book are basically identical. So we, we are not going to have any more videos about first the A version, then the B version, because it's all basically going to be the same. Um, any changes are, are very, very minor. So here at A409, at the beginning of the first section, Kant tells us the following. Reason really cannot generate any concept at all. Right? Reason is not the faculty of concepts, that's the understanding. But can at most only free a concept of the understanding from unavoidable limitations of a possible experience, and thus seek to extend it beyond the boundaries of the empirical, though still in connection with it. So here we see why, why reason might give rise to illusions, right? Because it can take the concepts of the understanding and push them beyond their application in experience. This happens when for a given condition, reason demands an absolute totality on the side of the conditions under which the understanding subjects all appearances to synthetic unity, thereby making the category into a transcendental idea in order to give absolute completeness to the empirical synthesis through its progress towards the unconditioned, which is never met with in experience, but only in idea. Reason demands this in accordance with the principle, here's the big principle, if the conditioned is given, then the whole sum of conditions, and hence the absolutely unconditioned, is also given. So what kind of thing is Kant thinking of here? Um, he himself gives the example of time, and I think that's, that's fine. So if we think about a, a particular moment, like this moment now, right? this moment now could only happen because the previous moment has elapsed. Right? It's only because the previous minute has totally elapsed that we have come to the now. Um, to this moment, when you are listening to this video, right? like one of the high points in the history of human, human history, whatever. Um, now that minute that came before this, we could only get to that. I mean, that could only sort of come into being because the minute before that had elapsed, right? If that hadn't elapsed, then, then this, this previous minute wouldn't have, like if the minute two minutes ago hadn't elapsed, then the minute one minute ago would never have been reached. And of course, this sequence goes on forever, right? I mean, for every minute, at some point, like the earlier minute would have to have elapsed and the earlier minute would have to have elapsed. Um, well, reason is going to tell us, Kant says, that you know, in order for this particular moment to be possible at all, right, at some point we must have something which is no longer conditioned, right, which is no longer based, which no longer requires something else to have happened or something else to exist or something else to be the case um, before it itself can be the case. Right? If, if A is only possible because of B, and B is only possible because of C, and C is only possible because of D, and so on, but if at the same time A is real, then reason tells us, well, you know, something must be the case that makes all of this possible, or even that makes all of this actual. That is the unconditioned that we are looking for. So if the conditioned is given, then the whole sum of conditions and hence the absolutely unconditioned is also given. Okay, Kant then points out, and this is at A411, um, that this only works in one direction, right? And we, he, in fact, he talked about this already uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the dialectic. It only works in one direction. I mean, for, for the present moment to be given, like the future doesn't have to be given, um, but the past does, I mean, we have to have traversed the past. Right? So there's a certain kind of um, asymmetry here towards the conditions rather than towards the conditioned. Then, starting uh, at the end of A411, Kant is going to walk us through the table of categories. And he is going to tell us that basically for each of the four groups of categories, there is a particular uh, antinomy that's going to pop up, a particular way of finding such a sequence of conditions that asks us for the unconditioned. And so number one, when we think of quantity, well, there's space and time and the question of whether, you know, well, 
in the case of time, whether, you know, what happens when we go back to time? I mean, we, we sort of need this entire sequence of past times in order to get to the present. When it comes to space, in order to sort of understand and, and place this part of space where we are, we need a further path that delimits it and a further path that delimits that and a further path that delimits that and so on and so forth. And so, so we are face to face with the eternity of the world uh, and the infinity of space, right? The eternity of time and the infinity of space. That is, that is number one. Number two, when it comes to quality, um, Kant wants to think about reality in space, which is sort of that which is in space, the real in space, which he calls matter. Um, and matter seems to be something conditioned as well. Anything that's real in matter would seem to consist of, of smaller parts. Right? And those smaller parts would seem to consist of yet smaller parts that make it possible. Um, does this ever end? Does this sequence of conditions ever end? Is there a smallest, like a simple in nature, or is matter infinitely divisible? That is the second question here. The third question has to do with causation. Right? A has a cause which is B, and B has a cause which is C, and so on and so forth. What about that kind of sequence? Right? Does it go on forever? Hmm. Um, or does it stop? But then we would have a very special kind of event, a kind of event, a cause that is itself uncaused, which is what Kant calls transcendental freedom. So the question about like causation and freedom is going to be the third question that we have to uh, have to ask. And the fourth question is about um, well possibility, in this case contingency, right? Everything that seems to exist. Uh, seems to be contingent. It could also not have existed, except for the fact that, you know, it was made necessary by something else, right? Uh, which in turn was made necessary by something else, which in turn was made necessary by something else. And so we have a question of whether there is, and if so, in what sense, um, a, a necessary being. And Kant is here thinking about a necessary being as something that either happens in the world or maybe that is the world, because the procedure in the antinomies is supposed to take us to the, well, at most, to the sum total of everything that, that, that could be found in experience. Uh, it's not supposed to take us beyond experience altogether, right? So the absolute or, or necessary being that we're talking about here in the fourth antinomy is not really a fully transcendent god. Right? It, it maybe it's the world itself, or it is something that could be found in the world, um, but it is not like the completely transcendent god of uh, theology, which is going to be the topic of the third chapter of the di of this second book of the dialectic, um, the ideal of pure reason. Okay, so those are the four sets of questions that we will have to wonder about. Um, here is something interesting that Kant says, starting at A417. He basically tells us that there are two ways to think about the unconditioned in, in every case. Now, one can think of this unconditioned either as subsisting merely in the whole series, in which thus every member without exception is conditioned, and only their whole is absolutely unconditioned. Or else the absolutely unconditioned is only a part of the series, to which the remaining members of the series are subordinated, but that itself stands under no other condition. What is Kant talking about? Well, he's talking about two possibilities. If I'm looking for the unconditioned, I have this sequence. There are really two ways of finding it, right? Either I come to a special member of the series, right? Which has itself no condition. So I go back, 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 and bam, there's the special member of the series, which needs no further condition awesome, right? That is the beginning of the chain of conditions. That's one way of thinking about this. Um, the other way of thinking about this is that, no, that's not possible. Um, the only thing that's unconditioned is the infinite sequence as a whole, right? It is no particular member. It is only the infinite sequence as a whole that is unconditioned. And these two ways of thinking about the unconditioned are going to appear again and again and again as the possible answers to the four questions that we need to ask, or the five questions that we need to ask, if we uh, remember that um, when it comes to absolute completeness of composition, space and time are sort of different things.
So to give an example of that, let's think again about time, right? About whether whether the world has a beginning. If you think that there is like a special member which didn't need any further conditions, that is like claiming, well, that is claiming that the world had a beginning in time. That's a first moment, a special moment that didn't require a previous moment in time. Okay. Um, or we can say, no, 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 it must be the whole, the infinite whole of time that is sort of the unconditioned. And that would come down, uh, amount to claiming that the world is eternal, right? That it has existed forever. So that would be the question about the boundary of the world, the beginning of the world. Uh, we can find the same when we think about a boundary to space. Um, whether there are any simples, right? If there are simples, if there are elements of, of nature, of matter that cannot be subdivided any further, then they are the first terms of the sequence. But if they can be divided further, if everything can always be divided further, then it's only the sequence as a whole that could be unconditioned. Um, if there are any first causes, then they are, you know, the, the, the moments of transcendental freedom. And, okay, that's great. Um, if not, if the sequence of causes goes on forever, then it's only the whole as such that could be unconditioned. And again, the same for uh, the same for uh, uh, contingency itself. Contingency and necessity, whether they're a necessary being. So Kant then goes on to introduce two expressions, world and nature, which are sometimes run together. The first signifies the mathematical whole of all appearances and the totality of their synthesis in the great as well as in the small. But the very same world is called nature insofar as it is considered as a dynamic whole, and one does not look at the aggregation in space and time, uh, but looks instead at the unity and the existence of appearances. So here we have a distinction between the mathematical and the dynamic, which we already know, right? When we, when we uh, back in the table of categories, back in the metaphysical deduction, Kant made this distinction between mathematical and dynamical categories, um, and then in the system of principles between the mathematical and the dynamical principles. And now here, he introduces these terms world and nature for two ways of thinking about the whole, right? And, and when we think about the world, we're sort of thinking about the world as an aggregate, right? As, as all this stuff put together, as if when we are thinking about the the infinity of space or the eternity of time uh, or the divisibility of matter. It's all about aggregates. It's about bringing things together. Whereas the dynamical principles, <coughs> or I should say here, uh, the dynamical way of thinking about the world is thinking about um, what happens in the world, the different experience, the content of the different experiences and how they hang together, how they could make each other necessary. Um, and so those are the dynamical principles so what Kant says, and this is at the beginning of B448, he says, in regards to the distinction between the mathematically and the dynamically unconditioned, I would call the first two world concepts in a narrower sense, but the remaining two transcendent concepts of nature. Up to now, this distinction has been of no particular relevance, but as we proceed, it may become more important. Spoiler alert, it does at some point later on Kant's going to explain to us that there is an important difference between the first two mathematical antinomies and the second two, the third and fourth um, dynamical antinomies. So we'll, um, we'll see that later. We will just keep this in the back of our mind for now. All right, well, that brings us to the beginning of the second section. And the second section is one of the weirdest sections in the critique of pure reason, maybe sort of typographically, it is the weirdest section, because after an introduction, Kant is going to talk about these four conflicts of transcendental ideas. And what we are going to get is a thesis and an antithesis on two opposing pages. Um, thesis, proof, commentary, antithesis, proof, commentary on these two opposing pages sort of to show that, you know, these are two, two separate ways of thinking that we actually can't bring together. Um, but both of them are, are in a sense good. That's what Kant's going to, to exclaim, uh, not exclaim, claim. I don't know, maybe he exclaimed it too, like Archimedes jumping from his tub and, and screaming Eureka. 
can't maybe jumped from his top and screamed Antinomy Um Ran naked through the streets of Königsberg telling everyone that reason gets into an entirely natural conflict with itself. Possibly not. I wanted to say I like the image, but I'm not sure I actually like the image. So, at B449, Kant tells us that um, each of them is not only without contradiction in itself, but even meets with conditions of its necessity in the nature of reason itself. Only, unfortunately, the opposite has on its side equally valid and necessary grounds for its assertion. So what Kant is telling us here is that, you know, the arguments that he is going to give are supposed to be, in, in some sense, good. They are supposed to be without contradiction, and they even meet with conditions of their necessity in the nature of reason itself. Right? They make sense. Um, they're not just sort of sophistical plays on words or something like that. When we try to think through this relationship between the conditioned and the unconditioned, we actually get like into these argumentative chains, like into these ways of thinking. They sort of immediately follow from that. And maybe we can say something very general about that at the outset, right? We have seen what the general form of the antinomies is supposed to be. There's this chain of conditions and either two ways of thinking about that when we try to get to the unconditioned, either there's a first member or it's the whole um, that is unconditioned. And basically, the problems with that is that if you think that something like that this chain of conditions just stops at a certain point, well, how are you to understand the unconditionedness of this first member, right? Because surely it is just like all the other members. Like a first moment of time is not different from any other moment of time as such. Um, so why doesn't it require a further condition? That might seem to be an insoluble problem. At the same time, if you claim that, no, no, it's the entirety, sort of the infinity of conditions that is itself unconditioned, you get into the, the, the problem that, well, if every member of this sequen sequence is, is conditioned, is not necessary, how do they build up something that is necessary? Right? I mean, that too seems to be hard to, hard to understand, hard to explain. Um, possibly, possibly, it would have been best for Kant to just give a, a very general argument like this. But he is, in fact, going to give us very detailed arguments for all of these antinomies. Uh, and to be honest, these arguments are maybe not always the best. They might have looked, I don't know whether they looked like really good in their historical context. I don't think all of them are like super, um, super convincing to us. Some of them seem to be based very much on what we learned earlier in the book. Okay, uh, some of them, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. We'll talk a little bit about it. So Kant goes on at A422 to say that every human reason must necessarily come up against these problems in the course of its progress. And so what we have here is a natural and unavoidable illusion, which even if one is no longer fooled by it, still deceives, though it does not defraud, and which thus can be rendered harmless, but never destroyed. So the illusions here are not like the paralogisms, which are really just mistakes in reasoning, and we can sort of recognize that and, and avoid it. These are more like visual illusions. Right? Sort of, they will stay with us. We will always feel the power of these arguments, even if we know better than to accept the conclusion. Right? That is sort of the picture that Kant is painting for us. And then he has some, some uh, interesting remark about the relation between understanding and reason, which I will read out uh, before getting to the conflicts themselves. Such a dialectical doctrine will relate not to the unity of understanding in concepts of experience, but to the unity of reason in mere ideas, whose conditions, since, as a synthesis according to rules, must first be congruent with the understanding, and yet at the same time as the absolute unity of this synthesis must be congruent with reason, since that, this will be too large for the understanding if this unity is to be adequate to the unity of reason, 
and yet too small for reason if they are suited to the understanding. From this there must arise a contradiction that cannot be avoided, no matter how one may try. To be honest, I think the translators could have maybe cut up this sentence a little bit to make things easier for us. Um, but the idea, I, I like this claim, right? That, that reason tries to take these concepts of the understanding um, and use them beyond the bounds of possible experience. And so, for what results to be congruent with reason, for it to satisfy reason, it has to be too large for the understanding, which means that, you know, there's no real content there anymore. There's no objective validity there anymore. Um, and yet, if they are suited to the, to the understanding, they would be too small for reason. They don't satisfy our rational urge. And so there's something unsatisfying um, in the way that, that the understanding and reason work together. And that is very interesting. And that's also very interesting for Kant, who believes that human cognition must be taken to be sort of adequate. It must be taken to be right, um, a, right a, a good way of thinking, like, like functional, like teleologically perfect. Uh, so how is this even possible, that reason and the understanding sort of don't match, don't fit? That is going to be one of the problems that the later parts of the antinomy are, are very much concerned with. Okay, so now we have these four proofs, uh, or, or eight proofs actually, or maybe 10 proofs. Um, I really don't want to talk about them in, in too much detail. I think we have seen the um, sort of the basic structures of uh, how Kant is going to approach this. Maybe let us look at the, uh, at the first conflict of the transcendental ideas as a sort of um, example. So the thesis says that the world has a beginning in time and in space it is also enclosed in boundaries. Proof. For if one assumes that the world has no beginning in, in time, this is very important. This is very important. Kant is going to give a reductio ad absurdum. Right? He is going to show us that the opposite leads to a contradiction and therefore the thesis must be true. When it comes to the antithesis, he is going to do the same. Right? So both the defender of the thesis and the defender of the antithesis, according to Kant, are going to argue by showing that the opposite claim is wrong, that the opposite claim is impossible. If one assumes that the world has no beginning in time, then up to every given point in time an eternity has elapsed and hence an infinite series of states of things in the world, each following another, has passed away. But now the infinity of a series consists precisely in the fact that it can never be completed through a successive synthesis. Therefore, an infinitely elapsed world series is impossible, so a beginning of the world is a necessary condition of its existence, which was the first point to be proved. Uh, and so what Kant tells us is that, like, believing that there is an infinite of time that has already elapsed is believing something that is impossible. It would be as impossible as, you know, starting to count one, two, three, four, five, and then at some point finishing. But how can you finish that? Well, actually, it is sort of the opposite of that, right? Actually, it would be like meeting, I, I, I got this, this thought experiment from someone, but I'm not sure who. Um, it's like walking into a room and finding there's somebody who is counting down, like five, four, three, two, one, zero. And he says, wow, phew, okay, I did it. Um, I counted all the natural numbers backwards, like all of them, right? Not, not starting at a million or starting at a billion, all of them and finishing. And that's like, how could you, 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 you couldn't start, right? I mean, you must have been doing it from eternity, but does this even make any sense? Doesn't really seem to make any sense. So that is what, what the thesis is telling us. This doesn't make any sense. And so the world must have a beginning in time because otherwise we could never have arrived at the here and now. Uh, well, at the now, the here is, is something else. Um, the here is maybe what the second part of the proof is about. Regarding the second point, again, assume the opposite. Again, assume the opposite. 
so that space is infinite. Then the world would, would be an infinite given whole of simultaneously existing things. Now we can think of the magnitude of a quantum that is not given as within certain boundaries of every intuition in no other way than by the synthesis of its parts. And we can think of the totality of such a quantum only through the completed synthesis or through the repeated addition of units to each other. Accordingly, in order to think the world that fills all space as a whole, the successive synthesis of the parts of an infinite world would have to be regarded as completed. That is, in the enumeration of all coexisting things, an infinite time would have to be regarded as having elapsed, which is impossible. Basically, what Kant seems to be doing here is arguing from what would be needed for us to construct the idea of infinite space. And he seems to be suggesting that we would, in a sense, in a sense that would require an infinite time to elapse. I'm not wholly sure whether he means it would really require an infinite time to elapse or whether it would merely require the thought. Maybe it's just that, right? Just require the conception of an infinite time having elapsed. Like sort of the idea of all of space is in a sense the idea of going through an infinite number of stages um, in your construction of it, which would mean that it is just as incoherent as the story about time, except that we are now at the level of our, our, our thoughts, our concepts, uh, rather than um, the world itself. I'm not really sure what to make of this, right? I mean, and, and this would seem to be the kind of point where you, um, where you could spend a lot of time with, with actually most of these proofs trying to figure out the details. And I, put, I mean, power or more, more power to you if you want to do that, right? And, and there's definitely uh, quite a bit of literature on that. Um, I don't think it's the most interesting thing about the antinomies. I sort of get the, the underlying idea. So maybe one final thing I want to say about the, the thesis here is that um, in the remarks, Kant makes this distinction between what we can call the relative and the absolute infinite. Right? Where the relative infinite is that which is bigger than anything else, um, or that than which no thing is bigger. And the absolute infinite is that which could never be completed. And Kant says we are here, we have to work with the notion of absolute infinity. So that's, I'm just really saying that because I'm interested in the philosophy of infinity, I guess. Okay, what about the antithesis? That the world has no beginning and no bounds in space, but is infinite with regard to both time and space. Proof, suppose that it has a beginning. Since the beginning is an existence preceded by a time in which the thing is not, there must be a preceding time in which the world was not, that is, an empty time. But now no arising of any sort of thing is possible in an empty time, because no part of such a time has, in itself, prior to another part, any distinguishing condition of its existence rather than its non-existence. Thus, many series of things may begin in the world, but the world itself cannot have any beginning, and so in past time it is infinite. And in a sense, the idea here is that, um, you know, if, and, and Kant does, seems to be thinking not about the beginning of time, um, in the way that certain modern cosmologists would want to talk about it, uh, but the beginning of the world in time, right? And he says, well, the world can't begin in time. And this is, this is a very traditional argument, which is okay. I mean, Kant is trying to give traditional arguments. Uh, it can't begin in time because it would be completely arbitrary for it to begin at that point rather than some other point. I mean, there's nothing there which could make the world begin. I mean, how... It's, it's empty time, right? I mean, there's nothing there that could make the world begin. Some thought like that seems to seems to underlie the, um, the antithesis here. Okay. I think I am going to leave it at that which with these four conflicts. Uh, of course, you should absolutely read them in order to understand well what is going to happen later on. Um, but I wouldn't worry, like I myself wouldn't worry too much about the details of the arguments, right? Can't, all these arguments have a very peculiar status. They have the very peculiar status that Kant says, look, these are the best arguments that um, the defenders of the thesis and the antithesis can give. So he's sort of putting them forward as good. But of course, they're not his arguments, right? He doesn't actually agree with them. Um, what 
what he is interested in is the fact that we have these arguments that proceed from our, our thinking of the conditioned and the unconditioned, and they always lead to paradox. They always lead to paradox. Uh, and it's the paradox that Kant wants to understand. And so in the next video, we will continue with the third section on the interest of reason in these conflicts and see how Kant is going to talk about and understand these paradoxes of reason.